What's up and welcome back to Kind of Funny's Dune in Review. Of course, I am Tim Geddes. I am joined today by the big dog himself. Kevin Coelho. I'm so happy, Dune. <laughs> the producer <laughs> slash seducer and his popcorn bucket, Nick Scarpino. Whoa, it's the Madib. <laughs> uh, yes. Did, you didn't know he was in it, did you, Tim? Oh, my God, you did. <laughs> you didn't know he was I'm ever so in happy that nobody told me. Even <laughs> last, I week, last week. week. I'm so it. happy that within minutes of this film starting, that's who the emperor was. All right, man. All right. Oh, we rounded out the group today. Of course, we have my Canadian twin, Matt Rohrbeck. Nick, I just want to say congratulations on being the father to a brand new baby sandworm. Uh, we can finally answer a question we asked last week of what does it smell like? Hmm. It smells like sin. <laughs> It smells uh, like okay. illicit. I hate that it has yeah. a little nose hole for you. I don't. You, that, uh, Nick, I want to compliment you on that one. <laughs> smells like sin is a great response. I yeah, got to tell. Let's good. start off with this. Please right let's yeah, let's please, go. For please, it, because I thought everyone yeah. was going to get one of these, and it turns out I'm the only person dumb enough to drop 24 American dollars on this. Now the guy was like, "Do you want to get the?" Well, first off, he referred to it as the fuck bucket, which was an odd <laughs> That's thing not a joke. for an, an AMC employee to say mm -hmm. to a person he just met. <laughs> but hey, you know it's me. Maybe he saw my face. Maybe he recognizes me. Hey, I'm the internet's Nick Scarpino. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I tweeted a picture of this, and a lot of people apparently like it. <laughs> Whatever. Now, before you did that, though, I, I saw your tweet, of course, <laughs> Nick, and I was like, "Oh God, I showed people here. Oh, he did it." And I forgot who it was. I think it was Andy. It was like. Oh, did he did he tweet it at you? Like, no, he didn't tweet it at me. Like, he, he just tweeted it. Thank God. I then pulled up my phone. You had texted it to me, just me, before you tweeted Privately, it. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. God damn it. I should have known. <laughs> now, I think that, to be fair, I think the guy called it the sex bucket. I don't think he called it the F bucket. Okay. If memory serves correctly, I think it's <laughs> called it the fair, sex bucket. Let's give this guy credit. Yeah, because yeah, sure. yeah, the hard F in that one was, uh, it came out. I was like, F, I don't think okay. <laughs> so I buy this thing, and he goes, hey, do you want, do you want the popcorn in the bucket? Or do you want the popcorn separate and you want to save this? As Did a he say the bucket? <laughs> yeah, he said the sex bucket. He goes, you want to put the popcorn in the sex bucket? Or yeah. do you want a, no, another bucket on? And then, and I was like, is that because you think I'm going to collect this thing? Or do you think I'm legitimately going to come home and, and, and do something to this thing? Anyway, I was like, put the popcorn in the bucket. I'm not, I'm not trying to have five buckets around me, right? Get this right. thing in. God. And the there very is. first. That's, that's what he tweeted out to is. the world. You guys can go retweet the that The finger really, really Yeah, that it. Yeah. Look really how many uh, responses it has. Uh, it's got, oh, 69. Perfect. Nice. Everyone stop yeah. responding. Don't reply That's to this incredible. ever again. Perfect. I'm going to say yeah. something that this obviously is, is for a movie of Dune part two's caliber, mm -hmm. this gimmick is so ridiculously like tone deaf for this yeah. movie. So whatever studio exec decided to make this a thing uh, as a marketing tool clearly has never seen Dune, has no idea what Dune is, and was just like, boom, big bam, boom, energy word, synergy. We're yeah. going to do this, we're going to do this. Having said all that, I've never had more review. fun eating popcorn than I had trying to get the popcorn out of this thing, <laughs> which is the worst popcorn dispenser <laughs> on the planet. That's it's what you want, right? One of the most visually beautiful and stunning movies that demands your attention the entire time, and you're sitting there looking at your fuck bucket, trying your hardest <laughs> to make sure you can get yeah. some popcorn. Imagine, Pretty imagine, because I saw this movie with my wife. She loves Dune Part One. She's watched it many times. She was very excited to see this. So imagine when it's like, like the moments where it starts getting really, really silent and the tension starts building, and you just hear me going like this, <laughs> rustling. <laughs> no, it's not. no, you weren't making guttural thing, noises. I was trying to because here's what it does: it traps your hand inside, and so when you grab popcorn, you grab a piece of popcorn, but it traps your hand, so you have to narrow your hand to get the popcorn out, and you end up having one kernel every single time. <laughs> To the point where I just, I just literally took the lid off and put it next to me, and then midway through the movie, forgot it was there, oh. and thought the seat next to me had a butthole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is Dune yeah. in Review, everybody. This is kind of funny. It's in Review. Each and every week, we get together to rank, review, and recap different movie franchises. Um, I'm very, very, very happy that we are doing this one, and we're able to do it thanks to the help of our Patreon producers, including Carl Jacobs, Kashan Patel, Nathan Lamothe, Karen Lidner, James Hastings, and Casey Andrew. Thank you also very, very much. Because of your kind of funny membership, you get to watch the shows ad-free. You get them... Um, uh, live as we record them and you get a bonus exclusive show each and every day what a deal what a steal everybody uh, but if you don't have a buck to toss our way that's totally cool you can watch us on youtube you can listen on podcast services any way you want to enjoy us i would appreciate it very very much today we're talking about dune part two uh directed by denny Vil villeneuve villeneuve is it villeneuve, villeneuve. Is what we're going i with just it? listened to an interview with him okay. and that person said yeah. villeneuve great and yeah, yeah it was villeneuve. great 
Um, it is uh, has a running time of 165 minutes, a budget of 190 million dollars, and uh, it just came out, so we don't have updated box office, but it's tracking very, very, very well, which is uh, extremely exciting. May to, I, for one moment, us. go for it, Nick Barrett? May I please have the, my one? Hey, everyone, it's the internet's Nick Scarpino. Please see Dune Part Two. Please, I asked you all to come out for Blade Runner 2049, and you didn't do that for me. And now we're not getting another one of those, so I need you now. Please, my little worm buddy, my worm baby <laughs> needs a father, and only you, only you can provide a father for this worm baby by going to see Dune Part 2 this weekend. Bring a friend, bring your dog, buy them all tickets. We need to come out to support. Do you have anything to say, Malfi? <laughs> <laughs> Ew! I didn't like that. I didn't like how it's little fucking oh, no. teeth tendrils. Oh uh, my god! I don't bristles. even know. Now, if if it is your worm baby, aren't you its worm father? I'm could its adopted it, father, but it needs to be like, taught its own worm I language. Like you could have said that it, it, it just needed to grow. You know? Yeah, feed my baby. <laughs> the podcast, Mike. All right, let's talk about Dune Two, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Matt, I want to start with you. What did you think of Dune Two? Uh, I want to stay on the popcorn bucket because I think you should have put blue Powerade into it oh. and then sucked oh, that and out sucked of it. Sucked it out of it. Time. I could. Yeah, yeah. That would right, be a reveal. A, again, this movie is too good for us to be doing this. Um, you know what? I think this movie is massive and incredible in every sense of the word. I think often um, we get sucked into hyperbole and kind of overhyping things. And I think when you look at Dune Part One and Part Two. Um, I don't think it's possible to overhype it. Um, I do think that these two movies together uh, become maybe one of the best sci-fi movies of all time, if you consider the six hours one film. Um, I think it's Denny Villeneuve's magnum opus. It's dense. It's strange. It's gorgeous. It's intense. It's I laughed more than I thought I would. Um, I think it's absolutely massive. I think it lives up to the hype. Uh, I think the new cast members are incredible. We already said Christopher Walken, but Florence Pugh is amazing. I think uh, Space Elvis is is surprisingly good as Fade Rotha. Um, I think Javier Bardem and Rebecca Ferguson steal the movie. I think Bardem especially is absolutely incredible. Uh, I think it does everything the first movie does and like, you know, goes to 11 or 15. Um, I think the IMAX cinematography is incredible. The score is incredible. Again, I had my watch going off multiple times being like, you're going to go deaf if you stay in here any worth longer. It. And it is worth it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just, I'm absolutely blown away. I can't believe, like I said last week, I've done a full 180 on the, on that first film. And I think when you put these two together, it is absolutely incredible. Can't wait to talk about every single detail of it. Um, you get a little black and white as a treat. You get, you know, like I said, Florence Pugh in the kind of Zendaya role where she's teased for future ones and only in a little bit of the movies. We get a little Anya Taylor Joy. Like, who saw that coming? I had no idea that was going to happen. I literally um, and just then, <laughs> gasped. Yeah, it, it's incredible. And like, and that's kind of that, even though this movie feels like the culmination of these two parts and does have all the payoff from all that setup in that first movie, I still think that even though there was no guarantee of getting Messiah or Children of Dune or anything like that, like I, I applaud Denny again to be like, you know what, I'm going to tease that there's going to be a third movie or a fourth movie, or maybe we'll get six movies or a TV show or whatever. And, oh, yes. and hope that people come out to see it and then that's the stuff that i love and i think that it works from just like a hollywood popcorn blockbuster level where you can go and just see these incredible images and and kind of just follow the basic kind of revenge story or or chosen one story um but then or you can go into it and see like a dense sci-fi political story about religion and false prophets and all this kind of stuff so i think it it weirdly has something for everyone <laughs> Um, and I think you really just kind of got to go in and you can just sit there and let soak it all in, or you can kind of really dive deep into it. And I'm absolutely blown away. I think it's phenomenal. Nicholas, I, this movie was awesome. And I don't mean awesome how we all just throw that term around to describe anything. This was literally yeah. awe inspiring in, in, in moments, the sand writing, the, uh, the worm writing moments, which was underplayed because we see Stilgar doing it first. We've seen, we saw it in the first one a little bit and then we see Stilgar doing it first. And I was like, Oh, that's how they're going to be, man. That's not a bigger moment. When he rides that, that is an experience in, in the movie theater that I don't know that I've ever had. 
And that says something about the caliber of this film. I said it last week. I don't think we as a audience, and I count myself chief among this, I don't think we deserve a movie of this caliber or two movies of this caliber. Uh, I'm, I'm right there with Matt where I think this is going to go down as Denny Villeneuve's opus. I think it's going to be his masterpiece. And I'm incredibly excited that this man is literally in the middle of his career. He's got way more movies to make. Um, yeah. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I thought... Any of the any of the shortcomings that Dune Part One had, as far as uh, the the story not progressing as much as we wanted, uh, that's that's uh, you know this movie takes care of a hundred percent because this movie is literally all uh, it's all plot, it's all action, it's all of the political intrigue that you want. I think they go even farther with making Paul a very very interesting and conflicted character, which I think is at the root of it. Um, I want to give a shout out to the costume design in this, specifically everything they put Florence Pugh in, who oh, every yeah. single thing they had her in, I just give them the Academy Award trophy now. Just let them have it. All of them. Um, the cinematography in this, I believe it was Greg Frazier, just incredible. All the natural light shooting they did in the desert, which I know must have been a pain in the ass, was definitely well worth it. And I think there are, there are just very little criticisms I can even make. Anything I would do would be nitpicky, small performance nuances here and there, which I think either some of the Timothy Chalamet stuff was a little a little wild. Some Batista stuff was a little yeah. wild. You see those moments, but again, you're criticizing high caliber actors because they're also in uh, you know in the, on the all star team when it comes to all the performances that are turned in here, which were just phenomenal. I do want to give a special shout out to Austin Butler, who I thought stole the show. I think his level of psychosis for this character and how much he nailed the Stellan Skarsgård voice to be yeah. his, his, his yeah. like yep. nephew was mm. just so off putting and so perfect for this role that I became an Austin Butler. I was like, I was on the fence about it. I was like, he's fine, but maybe he'll, I'm a huge fan of Austin Butler now. Love this movie. Cannot wait to watch it when it comes when, to my home. Uh, because there was a lady that was coughing the entire time when I watched it. <laughs> or, uh, not, I'm not kidding. The movie was 165 minutes. Mm -hmm. 150 of those minutes she was coughing. She left right when they were when the emperor landed on Arrakis. Mm. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Also, shout out to that sequence where the where the emperor's ship is just up there on fire. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what a visual. Oh, so go see this movie for Christ's sake. Kevin Koala, what'd you think of this? Now, my Dune luck is not good. <laughs> uh, I had an awful viewing experience did not detract from how much I enjoyed the movie. Uh, but, you know, tried to get there early. Didn't want to rush the people that I was with. My wife, my sister-in-law. They got some stuff and they were waiting for the food to come out. And uh, that was an awful experience just because so the, the worker at the AMC was very rude to me. Did he refer to you in any way <laughs> shape or form as a sex bucket? <laughs> no, but like, no. then we walk into the screener. And it is <laughs> fucking <laughs> packed. Normally, when you go to a screener, they have reserved seatings for yeah. the people that are going there for press. Um, the important, important people. people yes. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. You, you know. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, we, they didn't have that for this for whatever reason. And so we get in there, and it's like, no, you guys are going to have to split up. And it's like, God, I don't want to watch this movie split up, but okay, whatever. We start walking around. There's no seats. And we get down to the first Ooh, tough. row of That's seats. That's tough in the IMAX. Yep. Well, yeah, especially with Dolby and like the speakers. And there's only two seats. Paul looks at me and she's like, you got to watch this for work. Me and Avery will go see something else or we'll go home. And it's just, that's never happened before. Where yeah. I was just like, I'm sorry. You know, so you and Barrett had to watch from the front row oh, in my God. Dolby. <laughs> Which honestly... For this movie, it worked. Sick. It worked. It was pretty good. It was that, pretty good. I will say, like as, as uh, uh, someone who doesn't go to a lot of screeners, that was a uh, that was a wild organization for that screener. That was like, how did what what? Yeah. I mean, this that's part of me thinks good because that yeah. means there's a lot there's of interest hype. in this yeah. movie, yeah, 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 and yeah. people are going to go see it. So sorry you had that experience, but it it's it's unfortunate, but I think it probably gave me what will be the greatest like movie theater moment for me, which was when that, that sandworm scene happened, like the, the base was right in front of us yeah, in it. and like our seats at, at Dolby, they'll shake, but like with the added base and like everything that was happening. And I was like dead center in that center row. And it like, it felt like a religious experience oh, yeah. to <laughs> experience him get on for the first time. And it was just overwhelming in such a good way. Um, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the movie. It's interesting, the like the departures from like the like story that I I know 
So I'm curious to see and hope, hope to God that we get Messiah. I want Dune Messiah so bad. Go and watch this movie so we can keep getting them. Everyone, cut, can you cut to Kevin's one? Why is it my one now? I know that he doesn't have that set. <laughs> Just one sec. There we go. Hey, everyone. This and is no. Kevin and Mai's baby, the same worm. <laughs> hey, Mouthy, how you feeling? Mouthy has to eat. Please, we're supposed to see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know, know if that got picked up. Kevin jumps into action. He needs to <laughs> be the voice of, of fucking I'm sorry, Nick. guys. I'm sorry I'm this way. I don't know why my brain does it. I just came don't from apologize, this movie. Nick. Like, this is maybe the, the like, soonest reaction I've had uh, to a movie that I just finished watching, got in my car, came over here, and now I'm talking about it since Force Awakens uh, when it first came mm. out back in the day. This movie is phenomenal. It's awesome. It is everything that we've said so far and then some. I cannot believe what they were able to accomplish with this. I don't think between Dune 1 and 2, there's ever been a better setup payoff. And I can't believe I'm now looking at the first movie that I just gushed about last week as a setup. But it is. This movie takes everything that that one did and runs with it and just delivers every single second something that is just cool but not just for cool sake it feels like it is so earned so deserved and i was just engrossed in the entire experience it might be like i was talking about the sound mix last week i was like this sound the sound mix in this one is somehow even wilder and crazier and so much of it is noise so much of it is just you being rocked around and sandstorms around you but it doesn't feel like bullshit it doesn't feel like just put shit in a blender these are the highest quality explosions i have ever felt it wasn't even about hearing you feel this shit it was special man there are visuals in this that i will never forget it's like there, when I think back in to, to every movie I've ever seen, there are some things that stand out for good reasons, some things that stand out for bad reasons. But the, the Zendaya getting her like face burned off in like a vision, that did not expect that at all. Anya Taylor Joy being the daughter, and you see her in the future, what a moment, what a reveal, and what a performance of her for 10 seconds just looking. Mm -hmm. And it so many looks in this movie just nail so much performance like i'm just like so impressed rebecca ferguson might be the most badass human being on the She's freaking incredible. planet man and uh javier bardem his performance is it's spectacular he deserves so many awards and i love his commitment to the belief that this guy is the one so and you just see it grow over time in the movie the amount of times that he shouts out his guy who's like i told you it's happening. He's the one. <laughs> and then this is going to happen. And then it happens. I told you. It's just, it makes you believe, you know, like it was such a ride. I can't wait to see this movie again. Yeah. Um, everybody, please give me the one. Please. Give him Bucket. Give him Mouthy. Please feed Mouthy. Okay. He needs it. <laughs> we need this. I don't even know what the fuck Dune 3 could possibly be. I need it though. Go watch this movie. Everyone. I feel like everybody deserves it to go watch this film like this is one of those, this sci-fi in a way that like it's a little hard i will say way less than the first one the first one is a lot of yep. talkie talkie More setup or whatever yeah. this is this dude yeah. part two it's a movie man like this there's a there's a blockbuster element to this mm -hmm. but it is unfair to compare this to any other blockbuster it's there's just nothing. like fucking goddamn you guys I mean, on another yeah, level really dude, and that's the thing we talked about last week doom part one is all the questions this is all the answers right dude, it's all set up that's just act one so act this is this movie is, it's a little unfair because this movie gets to be all the fun parts yeah right when everything starts going down and then the rise to power and all that stuff but what i was uh, what i had sort of forgotten about because it's been ages since i've read the book was just the conflict with paul i think that's at the heart of the story mm -hmm. and i loved that so much that by the end of this you're like is he a good guy like is oh it's great you know like you got you it's see amazing. you see both sides and Kevin and I were talking earlier about some of the changes uh, specifically to Chani and how mm -hmm. they kind of set her up diametrically opposed to like what he was doing with the empire I guess her name is uh, Irulan uh, is yeah, the uh, the princess, the, the princess. Um, 
I was not expecting that. And I was not expecting to come out of this being like, I do question wh where this is going to go. I do see a, a future where Paul gets so elevated with this and so lost in the sauce of the empire that he forgets and or just goes back to being the same emperor that happened before, the same cycle of imperialism and colonialism. Uh, it, it, the, the ending, of, everything at the end left me absolutely wanting more because now I'm like, what are, they, what are the houses? I want to see this. I want to oh. see this battle that's going to happen. When, yeah. you get, when they get the call of like, the houses don't accept this, don't accept I was it. like, I didn't see that coming at all. Y'all, yeah. you want to know what I did not see coming? Not knowing this story at all? Mm. I didn't fucking expect this to have a I am your father moment. I did not expect oh, yeah. him to Incredible. be related to the freaking emperor <laughs> or the, the, the Baron. duke, yeah. the baron guy. What? The, the baron, actual yeah. hell? Like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a movie uh, where Gia had such a, a reaction to a reveal where it was just like, she literally said, fuck, like out loud. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, man. Fuck. So in the first yeah. movie, correct me if I'm wrong, that he was like he calls him cousin, right? He calls Leto cousin. Yeah, but is that I because think, he married into the family? No, I, I think that that was just like him him being like the Lan like the Lance Riots all like related like way in the past. Oh, okay. I I mean that's because I don't think he is aware because you wouldn't technically be someone's cousin if you married. Well, he didn't know. Cousin, he, right? he he does know. I think he didn't know. Because when he dies, I don't know if he did. He, yeah, he, yeah. The, one of them says something like, "Oh, you didn't know." I think it was Paul said, "You yeah. didn't know," and then he dies. But then, don't we see him look at her as a daughter? Or he yeah, knows that, that that moment's yeah. odd. Which I don't. Yeah, he don't like that's we or yeah we do. He's definitely above her, and there's a little blonde baby, and that yeah. implied is Rebecca Ferguson. See, I, I, I thought yeah. the implication though was that like he had parted ways with her uh, when she was like a baby. Oh, okay. So like yeah. He didn't know what she grew up to be. Right. So that's didn't. a good point, Barry. Yeah. Great point. You got to imagine this guy. This guy's got a lot of illegitimate. Yeah, children, right. For sure. But yeah, I mean, like, a good point too. <laughs> I, I mean, I believe in the Lord. It's it, like I don't think he knows. He like it's not like he willingly like someone tricked him into it. Is it like a Benny Jesuit thing yeah. where they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like we see not, later he not, Leah Sardo. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. She, yeah, which was crazy. Uh, yeah. Just. I know there's so much to talk about this. I just really want to say that, like, to be wowed by visuals happens a lot because we watch cool movies and there's cool stuff. The the black sun creating a black and white world so cool, that's dude. black and white for a reason, and then you see the shots of them walking through hallways where it's color, dude. and then when you see where the light shines down, and then it's just black yeah. and white, and then there's Incredible. these like fireworks that are like ink blots. Yep, it's just it like broke my brain. Yep. I was yeah. like, I Ooh, don't understand. Cool. Sequence is awesome. It's those moments. It's anything, anytime a spaceship does anything. And then this, the thing that blew me away were the shots in utero of his sister. Yeah. And With every time spice. it cuts out, I was like, oh, wait. what is this movie? I, I was it's like, like I don't know that I like this. I don't know that I like this. And then by the end, I'm like, I fucking love it. It, it, was, it was such an earned thing by the end of it. Did you notice also that like we don't hear her voice until you see Anya Taylor-Joy? And then from that point yeah. on, yeah. it's her voice talking to Jessica. Those little Great touches choice. just make this film so... The whole thing is just... Pitch perfectly weird, bonkers, and epic. Yeah. Epic is, I can't believe we haven't said that yet. Now, I want to get into the plot. I want to get into to everything. Are, are you good on that, Nick? We haven't talked about it, by the way. Great. Oh, I got um, that. Yeah, I got that. But before uh, we do all that, real quick, before we even get to ads, I just want to ask a very quick uh, version of this, I, without details of plot and stuff. What are the remaining Dune properties, and like, are they prequels? Or are they sequels? Sequels. Well, I mean... The, the the book's written by, Frank, is it Frank Herbert? Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert. There are six of them in total. They're all sequels. His son, Brian Herbert, I believe, um, wrote, I think, 21 books with someone what else. Fuck? Yeah, and a lot of them are prequels, but, like, the canonicity of them yeah. is, like, questionable. What, so what, what's the, can like, what are we hoping for from Danny Villeneuve? Uh, yeah. Three books, right? What? We want the first three books, right? I Well, no, so I would like the first three books as movies. Probably the third book, could either be two or three. So Who? sorry, sorry. Six books. How much has part one and two covered? One. That's Dune. One book. Dune. Yeah. But that's what you Dune, just watched was Dune. Yeah. Dune is massive. It's this what? thick. It's yeah. this thick. Yeah. yeah. It's like this thick. <laughs> Dune Dune is a very big book. Messiah is a lot smaller of a book. And then Children of Dune is, is in the middle somewhere. But yeah, I would like to get Dune Messiah. I would love to get Children of Dune and then God Emperor as a series. All right, God. Emperor. So Dune, just yeah. to get awesome. put in context, Dune, just <laughs> the, the paperback version is 704 pages. Okay. So what you just watched was pretty, I mean, I, yeah. again, I haven't read it forever, but it's pretty accurate to what the book was, the first book. 
All right. Also, before we get to plot, I just wanted to say, like, how did you guys see the movie? Because I've seen the movie twice now. I saw it both times in IMAX. And I just want to give me the one, Barrett, because I would like to tell everyone. Yeah, go see movies in fucking IMAX. Go see Dune Part 2 in IMAX. I think there's multiple different versions of IMAX. You can go down to Limax theaters, things like that. But seek (laughs) out Laser IMAX or IMAX 70 millimeter. Those are the two versions that I saw that are like the full frame, like, 10 story high screen um both experiences incredible the laser version it's shot digitally so the laser version is probably very very good to go see if you want to go do that but i just love seeing stuff on film i'm one of those guys it Mm. doesn't happen very often there's only a couple guys still doing it it's like chris nolan and denny villeneuve um and tarantino and a couple other people but for imax stuff it's it's villeneuve and and nolan there's only 12 cinemas in the world that are playing it on imax 70 millimeters so if you have one of those around you go see this because it's such a unique and kind of interesting experience like you get that flicker you get the dust in the grain and it just like when it fills up that entire frame it is spectacular so i just wanted to say shout out to imax it's my favorite format i know you guys love dolby i don't even have dolby here in canada so i've only seen like one movie i saw avatar way of water in in dolby and it was incredible but um i just want to give a shout out to imax and especially seeing this movie in one of those 12 imax cinemas with 70 millimeter i know that sounds annoying because if you don't live near a major city that has them but But if if you you do do, try it's worth it it. go do it yeah yeah, we saw it in Dolby, or me yep. and Kev saw it in Dolby at least. But, yeah. And I saw it properly in Dolby from a nice seat. Go see it in Dolby if you can. The sound yeah. is the incredible. image quality is it's oh my it's yeah. as good as it possible. And and uh, we were talking about this last uh, week, but like they also did like a fuller screen for Dolby, right? Yeah, it's, it's not the normal it's not the full, full, full IMAX, because yeah. like that's just not how the screen's shaped, but it there's no letterboxing on the Dolby, which they're is for most movies it does they they use the imax aspect ratio as much as they can to fill the entire dolby screen, let me so. tell you 15 feet away you wouldn't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, you know what's funny I mean, and i don't know if we're cutting to an ad right now we're about to but go we're, for it okay uh I, I, your experience is exactly how i saw gladiator back in the day it's a great movie i had to, i was dumb and got there super late and the only I, I just had to sit in the front row so basically all i saw was like a lot of Russell Crowe's like yeah. armpit. Uh-huh. I was like, I'm really close. I think he's like fighting with a sword or something. Still rocked though. Yeah, still yeah. rocked. Well, Gladiator we're about to two get coming this fall. Yeah. Gladiator review, maybe. I've never seen the first one. Oh, uh, we're Tim. about to oh get God, to <laughs> uh, the plot. But first, here's a word from our sponsors. <laughs> This episode's brought to you by Avatar Braving the Elements. We know you love talking about all things TV, film, and pop culture with us, so there's another podcast that we think you're going to enjoy. It's called Avatar Braving the Elements, and it's Nickelodeon's official companion podcast to Avatar The Last Airbender. Y'all already know Barrett loves Avatar. He thinks it's one of the best coming-of-age heroes journeys out there that perfectly blends enticing action, great comedy, and social commentary that's all backed by great art style and an iconic soundtrack. Each week, host Janet Varney, the voice of Korra, and Dante Bosco, the voice of Zuko, rewatch every episode of The Last Airbender. They're joined by special guests like the cast, super fans, and even the creators of Avatar, Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko, for a deep dive and behind-the-scenes look into the Avatar verse you can't get anywhere else. Whether you're a longtime vendor or new to the series, jump into the epic world of Avatar with Avatar Braving the Elements. Listen to Avatar Braving the Elements on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Y'all need to check out Kind of Funny Game Showdown, our weekly video game trivia game show. You can watch live on YouTube or on Twitch every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. But now, thanks to popular demand, Kind of Funny Game Showdown is available on podcast services. Whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anywhere else, please subscribe and rate the show five stars. It really helps us get Kind of Funny out there. And we couldn't thank you enough. We aim to make this a video-only show, so many of the games we best enjoyed watching on YouTube. But despite that, enough of you guys asked for audio versions so we're making that happen anyways of course that also means if you have the kind of funny membership on patreon you will now also get the audio version of the show ad free no matter how you're watching or listening to kind of funny game showdown thank you and if you haven't checked it out yet there is no better time than now we're already many episodes into the show so you can catch up now on youtube or the brand new podcast version of the show if you love what we do please get the kind of funny membership on patreon or on youtube to get the show ad free If you just want to support us for free please subscribe and rate kind of funny game showdown on your favorite podcast service now are you not entertained uh (laughs) ladies and gentlemen dude part 
two, uh, full transparency on this, of course, we saw the movie yesterday, so I did not get to write a full plot synopsis like I usually do, so I'm going to go off of the Wikipedia synopsis they have here. Uh, we're going to start off with Princess... Start where it starts. Oh, it starts with a quote. Yeah. Which is... Help me remember what the quote was. I think it was like, sand power is real no. power or something like that. No, wasn't it... Like spice equals power, power or something yeah. like Spice that? power yeah. is... Like yeah. all power or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Black screen, white text saying this, and just explosive sound all around. Like, oh, oh we're in, baby. And that power, voice. power over spice is power over all. Oh, there it is. Oh. Yes, there you go. And Hell I forget yeah. that mirrors. Of course, there was a quote that that began uh, the first part one, and I forget what that was too. Could you look that up? But incredible. And I love that there's a, a Reddit that says, "Could someone please explain to me how power over spice is power over all?" I'm like, that's a Y'all need to study economics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> come on, bro. It's not that hard to think about. Uh, we're going to start with Princess uh, Irulan. I totally forgot Florence Pugh was in this movie. And hearing her voice, I was like, yeah, this movie's going to rock. And I love everything about this. I love her, like, whenever we see her and, and where the emperor lives and how it's clean and, like, totally diametrically opposed to the world of Arrakis. And then how she reads, not very economical with a diary on a scroll yeah. of the, the scrolls, whatever. Yeah. It's analog. It's cool. You give, give them like an iPad that doesn't have Wi-Fi. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's fine. Would, we don't have to have any. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. she's secretly journaling that Paul Atreides may still be alive while her father, Emperor Shaddam, is uh, the fourth, <laughs> is dis, uh, dis, dispirited <laughs> after promoting the fall of the House of Atreides uh, en route to the siege. Uh, we, we can start there. But en route to the siege on Arrakis, Stilgar's Fremen troops, including Paul and Lady Jessica, overcome a Harkonnen ambush. We can talk about this scene a little bit. What an incredible moment. I think starting off with this, the first wow moment for me was that you have these uh, Harkonnen soldiers. They're not Sardaukar anymore. These are the Harkonnens, right? Mm -hmm. And they yeah. realize something's up and they go, climb. Mm. They see like a sandwich, like climb. They hear the beat, right? Climb. And they go, uh, that little sound effect. Yeah. And they just go up, and it's Dude, silent. And it go is up, up. so cool. So the first good. movie had the floating. silent drop yeah. in, in like kind of darkness. This just being, there's no hiding. We're in the desert. Them flying up, I was like, this is one of the coolest looking things I've ever seen. It's just so spectacular. Maybe turn on your shield, you know? Just maybe turn on your shield right away. <laughs> well, the, I don't, the worms, right? What's that? Oh, that's right. The oh, worms are attracted yeah, to the shields. Yeah, that's a great call. Yeah, that's a right. great call. So that's what's cool about this. We could talk about that a little bit, right? Because they have... Even shields, I think they, they have these like rail guns. Mm -hmm. And then they get shot with, I assume, whatever the Fremen version of yeah. the, is the bolt or whatever. Super cool. He calls for shields and then they all get just completely annihilated, which is rad. And then we get the, the shot moment. of them falling to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, visceral. Where is it? Yeah, it, exactly, Kevin. Like that's what the first movie and this movie does so well. Again, I think I mentioned it last week of where. I think they're PG-13 movies, but the intensity uh, of of both of these films, and especially this one, I'm surprised with how much they could get away with. Like, it feels like it's R-rated, but then I, I'm pretty sure it is PG because they do such a, like, a good job of making it feel intense without being, like, gory or disgusting. But even those bodies falling to the ground as Lady Jessica and Paul are there was um, unnerving in the best way. Yep. I'm looking it up right now. And I can't find it. The rating? Uh, yeah, the rating. I'll look, it up. look that up. I'm sure that's what's so interesting about this movie. Because if I watched this as a parent, I'd be like, no way my kid's watching this. This movie's yeah. intense. It's a lot. We have we're so ass backward in our culture right now with like, oh, we can't show blood, but it's totally okay showing all the other horrifying stuff that happens in this movie. Yeah, it's PG 13. This movie should be R. Yeah. But yeah. I'm glad that it's not. More people will see it. So we'll get yep. more of that for my selfish reasons. But man, don't take your kid to this. <laughs> uh, remember remember Fred's little cannibal girlfriends? Yeah, wow. Yeah. That is so wild. How he just kills all of his servants, like the maids, his yeah. handmaids. Weird. Uh, this scene's amazing. We have a couple notable moments here, too, where uh, the, the Harkonnen soldiers are dead and they're harvesting their body for moisture, and one of them's still alive. Yeah, and China just it. pushes his, oh, his yeah. hand away. <laughs> yeah. They're like, damn. Uh, from there, we go back to the siege. They finally make it over there. And lo and behold, Stilgar's like, hey, Jessica, got a, got a, got a bit of a choice for you right now. You're either going to go back into the desert and pretty much die out there, or you're going to become our new Reverend Mother because ours is on her uh, last legs. So we cut over to that scene of her. Real quick, I feel like a lot of moments Stillguard has are like weirdly comedic, and it works oh, so yeah. Yeah. well. It's just, I, I love his delivery of that, and like many moments later, but where it was just a little bit like, or you die. 
And it's just like, okay, <laughs> not a choice, I guess. Yeah, it, it really fit into even like him being like the religious fanatic side of it, where like it added a lightheartedness to something that's very yeah. serious, but it I, I think it added so much to his character. Mm -hmm. Like he's not a joke at all. He is not comic relief, but it it did add a levity mm -hmm. that this movie desperately needed. Yeah. Uh we get a shocking scene, of course, where they where they draw her in and they're everyone outside is like she's going to die because she has to drink, quote, the water of life. We don't know where it comes from, but it's blue and looks like Powerade, and it made me thirsty. Uh, she drinks it, of course, goes into somewhat of a coma, and then the Reverend Mother, great job by this actress, smiling at first and then realizes, because she's oh, no. connected to her, that there's, there's quote, an abomination. Yeah, but now. she also uses the voice on her to get her to drink it. Yeah, and you're like, oh, yeah, there's power here. Yeah. And then, of course, when she does drink it, uh, she becomes like Super Saiyan Jessica, and now she's just all-powerful. And now whatever is in her stomach is going to become... You have to imagine the destroyer of all worlds. Stop. I mean, what a cool ass thing to be like. Yeah. Oh, she, like the other ones being like, "Yo, she's pregnant. This isn't good. Yeah. It's bad. Abomination." Uh, we get a little hint here, of course, that uh, when she when they talk, that Paul is going to have to drink this to get to his final level, and he's like, "I don't want to do that because so legend tells uh, that men that do this die. If a, if a guy goes through this, if he drinks the, the water of life, he will in fact be dead." Uh, we get. But I also I just want to give a shout out to Rebecca Ferguson in the scene too, because that like exorcism sequence that she does is again going back to that intensity. Like I'm yeah. like, holy fuck! Like yeah, <laughs> I'm like, it was so good. They did such a good job of setting up the stakes of this though, where like and her like reacting to it, where you're like, oh, you see the results of this, but they kind of set it up of like, yo, it kills women. But it like really fucking kills men yeah, like yeah. instantly. And so it's like such a good like seeing her go through it and then later him go through it. It's like and the way he goes through it. Oh, man. I, I love what happens immediately after where. um, uh, Sorry, uh, Timothy is just like, hey, like it is a trick like like high level Benny Jesuits can transmog the poison in their bodies and turn it to not poison. And it's like he's explaining exactly how they survive and why it's only women because Benny Jesuits are always only women. women. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And it's that's also really cool. why does he survive? It's the same thing. And like, I have a question later that I'll bring up. Like, where like, was he, like, did he make it through it or did he actually need Chani to cry on him? I think he needed Chani. I don't, I, I think he would just like knew that like, hey, this is going to cement the prophecy even further. Right. Oh. So I'm just going to wait until she's there to, to so I'm yeah. kind of with Chad a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's noted here that I didn't quite pick up on, because uh, I'm not I could have swore it wasn't this way, but apparently when she drinks the water, it prematurely wakes up the baby in her, uh, like yes. opens her, like starts her mind up, and that's when yes. they start talking. I could have swore so, they talked before this, but I no, can't no, misremember that. It, it happens then. So um, do we understand that Benny Jesuits, uh, what's the Reverend Mother's powers? Like, do you guys have a clear? You know what's happening there? Mind control. It. it I mean, yes, it's, they isn't have. it like they have all the history of everyone oh, yeah. before yes. them in their brain? So I read that situation. Like uh, Nick, I think you're right that she was talking to you know her fetus before, but it was just talking as her daughter. But yeah. then after this moment, it's all knowing now, and it ah, is okay. kind of has all the all the same memories she has and all the Bene Gesserit have. So I, I think that's when she starts having deeper conversations with her fetus that's a weird sentence to say yeah. about <laughs> but i mean but we're also i think i don't know if we see it here first or if we've seen it before but this is where we start getting those shots of of the fetus in utero and i don't know how i mean denny loves doing stuff practically i have to imagine this is all practical how the fuck I don't they think did it so yeah. well. I don't know. I, I yeah. think it was right off the rip, too. Like, I think one of the opening shots of the movie is oh the, that's right. You're right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, they do underwater stuff. And Hunt for October. It's, it's exactly like shooting a submarine. You know it was a real baby? No, no, no. A real, like a puppet of some sort. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay. I'm that's what I thought you were saying. I yeah. was like, I I'm don't saying, think. Well, sorry, when I say something's practical, I mean, practical. I was yeah. Yeah. you're physically yeah. filming oh, it gotcha, with a video gotcha. camera. A, a, I don't, a camera. I, I would be shocked. I, I thought that was CG, but I don't know. I would love to see the behind the scenes on that. Yeah. yeah. Man. <laughs> here's, a, here's a fun fact. Did you know that they shot all the underwater sequences of the Hunt for October, which is a movie you've never seen or probably even heard about? They shot all that just underwater with like, with like smoke effects. No. Yeah, it's cool. I haven't cool. seen it. It looks but... great. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's get back into it, folks. She uh, she survives. Uh, also, Paul's like, "Yo, I really want to be a fremen," and everyone's like, "Yeah, we don't really trust you." And half of them are like, "You're you're full of shit." And this is where we really get the crux of the story here, which is uh, I don't I don't remember the other character's name, but she unfortunately gets burned alive in the third act. Yeah. She's like, "This dude 
is conning us, right? Mm -hmm. This is full of shit. And we get we start getting a lot of the history of the Fremen. We get we understand there's a different a divide between the North, uh, who are slightly more uh, or less, I guess, fanatical than the South, who are mm -hmm. all the fanatics that yeah. you refer to them as that. They all believe, and so uh, this is where Jessica starts hatching the phase two of the plan, right? Phase one, of course, steal the underpants. Yep. Phase two, phase three, profit. Yep. Mm -hmm. She's like, we mm -hmm. gotta start turning every single person. We'll start with the weak ones mm -hmm. toward our toward our cause. And she like looks over there's like kids pointing out. You're like, that's so messed up. It's so <laughs> it's, it's so, so fucked vicious, up. Vicious. But it's like she has a plan and she's gonna stick to it. It's such a weird and awesome thing to explore, which is like dogma and propaganda. Oh, and man. how does like these the idea of prophecy? Is that something that's divine or is it something that everyone just chooses to believe in? And that's even for Stilgar where you're like, he's so such a devout follower of this because he's religious. But there's also probably a part of him that's like, I just want this to be the guy because yeah. we need to follow someone. We need, but, a guy. We need to get our planet back, yeah. right? Yeah. But we also know that like the, the Bene Jesuits have been planning this and, and seeding yeah. these planets with these 100%. ideas. And for also 90 generations yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah. And also creating this this uh what's the name of the, the well, was that hatterat yes thank you uh so like it's it's one of those things that like i kind of feel like this isn't like a fate thing like this is the culmination of a giant plan and like i think they've been very clear and obvious with that that's why i'm so excited for Messiah. that's tight, that's cool exactly uh, uh let's get back to the plot here uh, oh where are we i skipped around a little bit following this just guys real conversation with Aliyah, i think is how you say yeah. the chelsea uh, in her womb Believes that those in uh, northern Arrakis must be converted first to the prophecy, starting with the weak-minded. Chani and her best friend, Shishakli. Love these girls. Mm -hmm. Believe I love the, the relationship yeah, between squad. them, of them just kind of like talking shit to each other. Like it, I feel like this was another, like not levity, but this is a moment of like a different side of the community. Of yeah. like, th We're these, seeing the Fremen. As, they're not all warriors yeah. and stuff. They're people too. Uh, of course, this is where Chinese starts to sort of come around because uh, even Stilgar's like, he's our prophet. And, and, and Paul's like, I don't want this. This is not why I'm here. I want to learn your ways. I want to be one of you. I want to fight alongside you. I want to, uh, you know, storm the Arakeen, the city, and take mm -hmm. back Arrakis. And they're like, well, you got in order to do that, you got to do this, this, and this. And this is seen later. I'm skipping around a little bit. But this is where he really earns his, her respect when he says, well, they're like, well, you're going to die. And he goes, well, then if I die, we'll get us one step further. And then you guys will go. And then you guys, it doesn't matter that we die. All that matters is that we take back Arrakis and turn it into the promised paradise that, that it should be. And this is where Chani's like, okay. Of course, we learn here, Paul does not want his destiny because he understands that in order to get his destiny, he'll have to leave. Chani, that's, I guess... They've sort of fallen in love, not really. They're going to fall in love later. Um, Paul starts to embrace the Fremen ways. This is where uh, I believe Stilgar's like, okay, if you really want to be a Fremen, we gotta, you got to go live out in the desert for a while. Yeah, he's and like, then go, the, go hike over there. Yeah, yeah. They just, just go like half a mile and yeah. see if you can survive. Uh, we get a little shot of a little desert mouse again, too, yeah. which can make his own moisture and like hide and stuff, the Madib, which is cool. Look great. Uh, from here, Paul's walking like an idiot. And then who does he look? He looks up on I, the ridge. And you know, not like I watched the movie and I was like, I like this shit. And you guys, when we did it, you were like, I don't know if I like it. I watched this like, what are y'all smoking, man? This shit looks. I, I want to awesome. say, I want to say, I apologize, Tim. You were right. Thank this you. scene with the music in this scene, I actually, when them doing it together, I'm like, oh, okay, this is kind of beautiful, and I, I actually like this scene. I just felt like it was goofy in the last. I like that she calls him out and she's like, you know, you're doing it too robotic. Like and he you starts have to. Yeah. It. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck you talking about, bro? Um, Matt, I'm not gonna let you apologize for that as your lawyer. Right, right, right. Uh, I'm actually I'm gonna listen that like that stricken from the record. Uh, please make the jury go in the other room because it was dumb in the first one but that was purposely done because mm. it not really purposely but it's a good yeah, setup for this yeah, moment yeah. where they actually mm -hmm, start mm -hmm. physically and metaphorically being in rhythm with each other which is actually yeah. a really really cool oh. bit of visual storytelling there and you really feel that uh zendaya and timothy chalamet great scenes here she's teaching him how to use the all the stuff she's teaching him how to be a friend and she wants she's starting to root for him which chemistry is off the charts and performances off the charts between the two of them and it starts in this scene really it grows throughout this movie so organically and it's so well paced that like you just believe in them uh as we progress of course paul gets to i'm again please feel free to fill in moments here because i'm skipping a lot of stuff i realize that for audio listeners or, or watchers you're probably like wait don't forget about this part sorry going off the rip here if this were me this would be a 10 page 
of notes and I would excruciatingly <laughs> detail this. You but. all need to go watch this in theaters. That's why we're so only going to years here. from yeah. now, yeah. we'll do a rewatch leading into Masarfe. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> uh, he, let's see, he becomes a uh, Fedekin fighter. This, oh, yeah, we can't skip this part. We, we go on their first sort of ambush oh, of man. the brand new. What I have to imagine is like the twenty twenty four model, or I'm sorry, oh ten thousand nine hundred ninety one like, models of this this the spice collectors. I feel like what we saw in in the Dune, the first movie, part one, is like they were right. They left them all the broke down shit because yeah. yeah. like yeah. that device that they dropped down is much cooler and like clearly new and fancy. But I don't think it was like. I think it was they just got the trash. So they took all the, the good shit away yeah. and left them with like the jalopies. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, they left them the <laughs> iPhone sixes when they got the. <laughs> all right, let's. I had an yeah. iPhone six for a really long time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so I just want to give a shout out to the design of this thing, mm -hmm. which uh, I don't know where the inspiration came from. I don't know if it was original art that was in the book or if it was from Yadorowski's Dune or whatever. But this thing looked like it came straight out of Yadorowski's Dune. It's looks like a head that is just rolling it's so off-putting and so cool and so weird and it's hard to explain but like there's no reason why it should look like this but it's so cool that it does mm -hmm. and that's sci-fi you know what i mean yeah. there's no practical reason why it needs to look like a big bulb this could just be a square for christ's sake anyway absolutely nick did you see the yodorowsky's dune documentary yes i highly suggest it to anyone listening to um really really cool doc about like the original kind of um filmmaker who was going to make dune and uh, a really really cool uh documentary but yeah this whole sequence kicks ass i mean tim you brought up the kangaroo mouse and how good it looked earlier and i think in this sequence as well like i and it's something we keep talking about, but I was just blown away by the visuals. Like this has some of the best visual effects and special effects that I've like ever seen in a movie. Like there was not one shot where I'm like, <laughs> this looks fake or this looks bad totally. or anything like that. Like this whole sequence is incredible from the moment she shoots the rocket launcher and lo launches that dude into the, the, the oh. spice harvester. I'm just all, that's the moment where the movie kicks into high gear. And I'm like, even though before that I was all in, I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I also, um, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but the scene was interesting because I left it and I was like, why wouldn't they just shoot the thing with lasers? Yeah, the to lasers. Begin yeah, with? I thought that too. And then I started thinking, I was like, because there's one ship that's around here that has shields. And if a laser hits a shield, they've already mm -hmm. established that it goes nuclear, right? Or whatever the hell. It could light the atmosphere on fire, yeah. mm -hmm. much like Oppenheimer mm -hmm. thought the, the original A bomb was going to do for, for us. Thank God it didn't. Uh, so I was like, oh, they have to ambush. They had to get. Like the plan was to kill the chopper first, and then they could just. I mean, and then we get the visual, the incredible visual that we get multiple times. I'm like, I'm for it, with just the the lasers shooting Swiss cheese holes in this yeah. thing, very silently, mm -hmm. very subtly, dude. And the lasers are horrifying. They're just the coolest things ever, man. And it's so, so so damn dope. And this whole scene, Barrett, you, you want to say your thoughts on this? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, this sequence in particular that inspired me to. Uh, uh, tweet this out, which was kind of my brief review of it. It's just. Give Denis Villeneuve uh, the, the Metal Gear movie. It is, like, at least in terms of uh, action and scale and pacing of an action sequence, I think that could really, like, that style and what he has visually going on, I think it really fit that there. It, it was such a such a treat, man. And I am so with you, Barrett, watching the, the movie. Like, even the beginning parts, I was, like, thinking of this yeah. tweet, and I was like, God damn, Barrett's right. And when this scene happened, I knew this is the scene you were talking about. I was like, <laughs> that is some Metal Gear shit. Yep. Please let that happen somehow, some way. But even if it doesn't, what we got here is more than enough. This action scene is absolutely incredible. Seeing the two of them kind of hiding in the, the shadows of the, the walker legs with the, the different lasers and the way that they're dealing with the weaponry it is just the most insane choreography it's like it's captivating camera work like the entire mm -hmm. time you're just with it and again the movie's use of sound and yeah. silence is <laughs> every single time breathtaking man breathtaking uh, from here uh paul is now being embraced by the fremen he's a badass warrior they call him a uh well he he gets to pick his name well that's not 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 yet because we have to because they're like we got one final test and what's that Gotta final test? Worm, then? baby. Let me explain to you something, Tim. Back in twenty <laughs> in two thousand seven, I didn't want to pay for a parking spot. Yeah. So I decided to get my motorcycle license instead, uh -huh. and I had to do a two day course right here in Daly City. Yeah. You guys drive by? I drive past it sometimes. Uh, and I got my license. Yeah. 
And then I never really rode motorcycles Good. after that. But I was different mm-hmm. from that part on, right? They let me pick my own name. I picked Nick. Great name. Yeah. This sand riding <laughs> sequence. What was your name before? It was Nick. Uh, <laughs> So I was listening to an interview on the way in an NPR. It's a great interview with Denny. Um, and they were like, what was like, they, he's like, that's this sequence of the sand riding, sandworm riding, his first time is breathtaking. How did you do it? And he was like, well, you know, it was the, the hardest thing was trying to make it believable. Mm. Because in a movie where so many fantastical things happen, right, surfing a fucking sandworm. And then he's like, the, one of the things that I, what I wanted to do is have it sort of like they're riding a motorcycle. Because at a moment, you just kind of see them kind of riding with these Harley grips. Yeah. And you don't really see the worm. They're like surfing across the, the, the sand. M- masterpiece. Masterfully done. I it is. Mm-hmm. It, it is. For sure. 100%. But. Weird as fuck. I, if I had one issue with the visuals <gasps> of this movie. <gasps> <laughs> and look. It's, it's not their fault. But it is a fact that the is scene. Is it the little flap on the worm? No, what? no. I was okay. okay. I was okay. I like the little flap. Honestly, because, I was okay with everything. I was Alfie even okay has with little how flaps too. If you want to put your stop. <laughs> everything about it was dope as hell. But every time we saw them riding the worm from afar, and we just see him kind of like surfing it, every single time, I couldn't shake the image. Guardians of the Galaxy of Kurt Russell yep. in yeah. Guardians yeah, of the yeah. Galaxy oh, yeah. just okay. waving. <laughs> and I, that's a me problem. Yep. But. Just I mean, had to share that kind of even does that earlier in the movie too. He yeah, waves at Paul time. as he's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get that. Yeah. I uh, get that. The sand going through the dunes, or the worm going through the dunes, boosh. The sound here is going to win him an Academy Award. Yeah. The, also, also Stilgard has a great moment here where he's like, uh, what does he say? Uh, like, you didn't need to call one that big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the oh, biggest yeah. one yeah. ever. The I'm grandfather such a worm or yeah. something. The I fucking grandfather <laughs> worm. Hell yeah, man, dude. It's so cool. I think it's just the tightest. Yeah, I think I think he says something like he's saying it under his breath to himself because he's worried about Paul, right? And he's like, Oh, not that not not that big. Yep. Yeah. Like, don't get that. Oh, oh shit. Like it's like a big wave surfer. Yeah. Much like the end. Oh, never mind. I'm not gonna spoil that. Tim's never seen the movie. Uh from here, they're like, You're the man. You rode the thing. You get you're, you're now a uh, Fedekin fighter, and you get to pick your own name. You got to pick a couple of different nicknames. Again, my favorite thing. This would give me decision paralysis, much like upgrading in a video game. I can never. The character creator screen is probably the level that I stay long. It's not in every video game. He of course picks the Madib, uh, and then his second name is Usul. The Madib, of course, is where we learn that it is in, in, in fact a little a little mouse that runs around. And Stilgar's like, hmm, that's a very venerable name to pick it's very unassuming but that is the only creature one of the only creatures that can survive out in the desert because it can create its own moisture nestle in and things can't get to it Hype. it's a great name for a person who's going to uh you know do a guerrilla warfare against a big empire jessica spiritually guides uh, his ascent and thereby fuels the religion in which she has become prominent glassu rabin whose grip on spice production uh oh that's uh batista right Blast Batista, yeah, yeah. yeah. Robin, they call him. Robin. Yeah, uh, yeah those names Robin. are Robin. So we, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Batista is awesome when he's awesome. Yeah. And he's just a little off when he's a little off. Yeah. And it becomes very yeah. noticeable. Well, and I feel I, like in this one compared to the last one, and it's weirdly in the action scenes. Like, I feel like his talking acting works way better than his action uh, does in, in well, this movie. I and that's feel like weird. Not early on, what, middle of the movie, we, we have Frayed. Suddenly hanging out with Robin, and it's like he immediately sh- shows that he's not the big dog, you know what I mean? And it's like it takes away, like, because like he's just, uh, um, he kills just a bunch of people that are nobodies. And when it comes to like someone that is his contemporary or his younger, his younger brother, I think, seems um, like it, yeah, cousin, it, like, I think, or cousin, they cousin? really, well, because he's he's it, the, no, fades the no they are brothers, yeah, yeah they're brothers, sorry, yeah. they are brothers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad, but it's like. He very quickly puts him in his place, puts the blade against him, and he's like, what is he, kiss my shoe? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's just like, it kind of takes away all his power, yeah. and he looks dorky after that yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, I'm not even necessarily and, saying about like, because like, the character stuff, it's more just like the, the scene of him on the, the big spaceship thing, like where they're like fighting, something about that just seemed goofy. And a couple of the scenes where he was like, close up action scene, it felt like, the bad part of pro wrestling instead of like good action hero stuff. And like, I was surprised by that because Batista's a fucking badass and like fights very well. Mm-hmm. I, I think his performance in this, again, not to draw a parallel, um, was a little, uh, I guess I want to say black and white, right? Where he's either on or off. He's either 
He's either standing there not saying anything or he's screaming. And I don't think that he has the range to really command scenes and be in that emotional, like that, that emotional range as he's sort of getting angry. So he just screams a lot and gets super violent. And then that becomes sort of white noise after mm, a while. Yeah. And, and it's just, you know, it's something that it's, it's hard to do as an actor. Totally. And I, I would even say my other, a, a criticism I have of, of Timothy Chalamet's performance is that in some of the sequences where he has to command those scenes by screaming and getting really hot too, I, I don't think he quite nails those either. It's all of this is serviceable. It doesn't take me out of the movie, but there is, a, it's hard to have that ramped up energy like there's maybe one actor that I could think they could do is like Gary Oldman, you know, where he goes yeah, from like zero to a like, thousand yeah, and you're like, holy quick. shit, like get out of this guy's way. And then Gary Oldman's probably like 150 pounds soaking wet. Whereas Batista's like, I'm big, I'm physical. And he falls into the same unfortunate like category of like a Momoa or the rock where it's like, I'm just going to be brooding. But there's no nuance to that upper register of, of yelling and anger. It's just, yeah. it's just go to hundred percent. Don't go, don't ramp it up. Don't do this stuff. You know, I, I, I disagree with you about Timothy. Like the first movie, I was like, ah, I'm thinking Wonka. I never thought Wonka yeah. in this movie. Like, I feel like him at, when he when his screams, I was like, oh, I didn't know this kid had it in him. And I was impressed by his his presence uh, as a leader because, like, in the beginning of the movie, I'm like, this fucker's gonna end up leading these people, and by the end, I'm like, this fucker's leading these people. Yeah, I, I think that worked. I think just this the moments with with Paul that I didn't think worked were mainly when he's in the South. And he's like, I'm this person, I'm this person. He, he he had a tendency to kind of rush the the delivery of all that stuff. And that's what Batista did too. And again, I'm not the director. I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here. But I would have like, slow, even Rebecca Ferguson was like, slow down. I'm like, yeah. I, I want you to give that note to these actors. Because when you're screaming and just rushing through stuff and you're slurring your speech, it kind of takes me out of the scene a little bit. And there's just moments where I don't feel like he command. I didn't necessarily believe in that moment where he's standing in the center of all these freedom fighters. Yeah, a- that he commanded it as well as like... If Javier Bardem had done that scene with his booming voice and his and his range, I think he would have been. I think it would have been night and day. Again, I, minor criticisms of this stuff. I'm kind of in the middle, but I, I see where you're coming from, Nick. But I almost see that as the point of like Paul's character too at the end, where he is this kid who wants to believe this so badly and wants to take over, you know, as as Duke of Arrakis and wants to be this prophet and things like that. So like that delivery, I. I while I, I I'm not a huge Timothy Chalamet fan, but like I, I bought into it by the end of this movie, kind of what Tim was talking about, where like I I felt that that was kind of the point that he didn't uh, really command it completely. I know that they believe in him, and by the end of it, he is you know their savior to in their eyes and things like that. And then going back to Tim's point about uh, Dave Bautista, I think what's interesting about him, I like. Dave a lot. I think he's like actually a really great actor. And and we mentioned Knock at the Cabin and Blade Runner 2049 and Spectre. He's really good in too. Um, in this, I, I, I'm kind of, I, I like him at moments and I, I'm with you, Tim, where in the action sequences, I almost think that comparable to everyone else where they probably got like stunt actors to yeah. do their choreography and him being a professional wrestler and things like that, they probably let him do a lot of his own stunts and maybe he was a little bit more stunt diff because of that or it just felt off mm-hmm. but like i'm, I'm kind of with you that some of those sequences i didn't love either but sorry i jumped into both of those points there to uh, but yeah, uh, yeah i'm Let, kind of in the middle if i could bounce right back off bounce from that R- raban i feel like gets done a little dirty in that last moment that he has against gurney where it's like wow like what a shitty fight that was like for, stabbed in the neck yeah like, but it's also so quick and like there's not much yeah. of a fight and like these are supposed to be some of the best fighters like gurney halleck is one of the best fighters in the Imperium, and it's and and he's just like uh, he's, he's been no wanting this revenge. Huh? <laughs> Don't worry. Okay, he's been wanting this it. revenge Thank for you. so long, and it's just like, oh, okay, it's done, it's over. That I I thought I would have liked a little bit more in that moment, um, and then to the Paul thing, I kind of feel like once he's doing that speech, he's got all his powers. He's leveled up as far mm-hmm. like he knows what he has to say because he can see the future so oh, sure yeah I, it's it's more of like he doesn't like i don't know i got the feeling like he doesn't like he knows how to like the the guy that like he responds to like i'm sure he responded to him because that was the the first person that was going to respond like and he knew what to say to him to like get him to break down so like he delivered the speech but like it's not like he was pulling these words out of nowhere. Like he knows what to say. Can, sorry, can we, I know this is jumping ahead a bit, but no, that, that part, I do have a question from sure. like, 
how did he know the thing that he said to that guy about the grandma or whatever? Because he can see everything now. Mm -hmm. He has kind of an omniscience at this yeah, point. Yeah, not he kind see, of. Because he can see like multiple like he sees like he's like Doctor Strange in yeah. like Infinity War where he can see all yeah. the, the potentialities of what's mm -hmm. going to happen. So, but like, and what, just like saw that. Obviously, that's very confusing. But mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, from my understanding, not it's like very well, okay, the 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 women as a Jesuits when they drink the blue, <laughs> mm -hmm. they can see the past, mm -hmm. right? Like the past ancestors. Uh -huh. He can see the past ancestors and the future ancestors. But like, well, how come he, he knows well, they, about that guy? They've are, they've also established that they have abilities to like not read people's minds, but like there's a moment where the the Reverend Mother's watching uh, Rabin and, and and Baron later, and they're talking, and she goes, he he has like. Like mine tells him they're not they're they're not lying. They believe yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. That that mm. moment I think is not like I I to me that's because that's uh the the Reverend Mother and Rebecca Ferguson are having that moment right where they look at each other. No, I'm talking specifically about the moment where they bring the emperor the emperor lands and they bring the Harkonnens in to oh. like testify what the fuck's going on. Yeah, that and Reverend Mother goes she she tells the emperor via like got it. Tele telepathy. No. I, no, she says it out. Oh, does she? Yeah, they're well, not lying. she's also covered by a veil. Yeah. So she so she's a truth. I think she's a truth speaker. Yeah. So that yeah, means that like or yeah, truth like sayer. That. Yeah. So remember in the first movie when they're like hey. We can't just kill Paul and his mom because what if they bring a truth sayer? A truth sayer can look at you and be like, oh, he's lying. He's lying, yeah. yeah. So cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, again, to your point, uh, the sequence where Paul does all that stuff, and and uh, Matt, you, you mentioned that Paul really wanted to, like, he couldn't wait to get to that part because he was like, I really want to be a leader. That's not, I think the sequence is awesome, by the way. I'm not questioning the yeah. mechanics of it. No, I'm no, not no. questioning yeah. how it built. I'm just questioning some of the moments with Timothy. I wish he had slowed down, well, like, been I, in I scene don't a little bit more. Yeah. Completely. But yeah, I will yeah. say, he did, he did it in an earnest way mm -hmm. that I think got across at the very least that he just wanted to get it over with. Yeah. Like, he just wants to, he's like, and, yeah. I don't want to do any of this shit. Like, I'll disagree with you, Matt. I don't think he wants to do any of this. I huh. think he sees his Fair. future, and it's not a good future, and it's yeah. a future where he has to leave the love of his life, and he knows he's going to have to break Chani's heart, and mm -hmm. he's just like, let's just get this shit over well, with Well, he knows right they'll get past that, too, though. Yeah, fair. Yeah, uh, but it's I. I well, he to, says to she'll me, come. She'll come yeah. to. She'll come to like realize this is what. No, that's a yeah. good point. But, yeah. Uh, but to me, that that um, it's it's like Groundhog's Day, right? Like by the end of the movie, like he's done it so many times that it's he's just going through the motions, yeah. and that's kind of what in my in fair. my view fair. is like he knows how much he has to deliver to get what he wants. Right. Why go further? And that's why Rebecca yeah. Ferguson's like, slow down. Yeah. Because it's basically like he's reading a script. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's and it's like, he, he got it. Oh, yeah. That's, that's very that's interesting. Good. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I do want to say also, I mean, again, I love Dave Bautista. I think mm -hmm. he actually is a very, very good actor. I just don't think they gave him, I don't think the character really got a lot of moments as well, to be fair to him, yeah. to actually have those nuanced moments. Mm -hmm. And I will say that if you go back and watch the beginning of 2049, he has... He's just captivating in that. Yeah. Where he has to take the mask off and he's he's doing the worms and all that stuff. And then he's like, you know, he has those little moments where we're close up with him where he actually gets an opportunity to act. Yeah. And so I don't want anyone to think I'm throwing shade at Dave Batista. I just think that they were like, be a brute. And he's like, all right, fuck it. I'll just no, do this again. Well, I mean, I just like, you know, this movie is what, two hours and 40 minutes, something like that. And it's like, they just didn't have enough space have to enough give space. him more time. And that's to and that. like, they introduced Freyd, who's his younger brother, who's more of a badass. So it's like, to that point, uh, and, I, and I had the same thought with the Gurney uh, uh, oh, Rab, uh, Raven fight oh. uh, at the end, but I think the reason they did that was because they were like, if this is epic, because we're going to get the Paul we're getting the Austin Butler fight, yeah, fight like five yeah. minutes later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like, we got we, we have to understand this. I, it's it should have been just, awesome. It, yeah, it hurt a little bit know, for it to be I like, know. oh, that was it? Okay, I'm with you, too. You have two yeah. badasses, and you're like, that was yeah. not that was yeah. not a fitting farewell to yeah. that character. But anyway. Yeah, we're uh, jumping all over the place. Jumping all over the place. We'll come back here, of course. He is replaced because he can't get it done. He gets all of his guys killed. So uh, Baron Vladimir, I don't know it was Vladimir Harkonnen, uh, it replaces him with his nephew, who is just coming of age, Fade Rafa, uh, Arrakis' new ruler. Uh, we get a great sequence here where he's he's in the, the this is the first time we see uh, uh, Giddy Prime. Well, and, no, you, you're right. We well, we were talking about this earlier, but we saw it in the first movie. Oh, right. I think it was a nighttime only shot. Only indoors. Yeah, yeah or so indoors we, or something. We right? see it here, and everything is is black and white, man. So it is cool. burnt. It is bleach yeah. so bypass cool. burned, so and it is crazy. The out black there. sun. Yeah, I I did a little bit of like googling, and yeah. it's uh, it's not that it's a, a, a black hole. It's that um there there's like a ton of pollution, and it's a dim sun. Oh, okay. So the light just so gets diffused. The color rays yeah. just can't come through. Fascinating. That's Fascinating awesome. visuals yeah. here. 
uh, we get him in the gladiatorial ring. Uh, he has to fight three of the the, the, la the last remaining Atreides people that they have captive. So they think. So they <laughs> think, uh, right? Uh, one of whom didn't get. I mean, they do the whole not to spoil Gladiator, but they do the whole poisoning of him a little bit, mm -hmm. so that uh, Fade can just kill him and 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 get more uh, juice in the community. It's his birthday, but of course, uh, the Baron understands. He's like, if you really want to be. You really want to be a badass and you really want to be respected. One of these guys, the best of the fighters, has to just come out without poison in him. Uh, and we get a great sequence here where those weird things with the demon heads are like trying to, oh, trying yeah, to they stop stick him. They're like so the lions cool. from he's Gladiator. Like, no, he's like, no, mine. this guy's mine. Uh, the guy, I don't know the actor's name, but the, his counterpart in this where they're fighting is badass. Mm -hmm. This guy's great. Yeah. The sequence is wonderful. He says, uh, you fought well or whatever as he stabs him in the stomach. And then, of course, he'll say that later to Paul when he's, got, he's gotten stabbed in the stomach. He's pissed off. But Baron's like, hey, it was a test, and you passed. Now everyone thinks you're a badass. They're actually scared of you. They don't just respect you. They fear you. So now you are going to be the new ruler of Arrakis, and you're going to go take care of, get the job done where your brother could not. I want to give a big shout-out to Austin Butler. Butler. I got 15 minutes into Baz Luhrmann's Elvis movie. And oh, was I like, hated Elvis, nope, dude. I'm not watching it. this fucking movie. Oh, I enjoyed the yeah, shit out of that movie. with you. <laughs> couldn't, yeah. get, couldn't get past. I was like, why? What's going on with Tom Hanks? What was these oh, choices that the were made here? Voice, what was it's, happening it's, there? Yeah, it's yeah. not his actual or not the accent that the man had. <laughs> it is just a fucking weird. That was just a fever dream of a bad movie, in my opinion. And granted, I love Baz Luhrmann. I love when Baz Luhrmann's going full Baz Luhrmann, but man, this is not. I didn't like it. So Austin Butler, I was like, I wrote you off, buddy. I don't want to see it. Started watching the Masters of the Air. Got 15 minutes in that first. I was like, not for me. See him in this. <laughs> yeah. Tim, were they born? Born, born in labs. In labs. Now That's it's time not. to rank those abs. You got to, man. Were they born, <laughs> born in labs? Now it's time to rank those abs. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Rank Those Abs, yeah. your podcast within a podcast. I'm your host, Nick Scarpino. Holy shit, he looked good in this. Yeah, dude. And I love to that the, the first point. shot of him really is his abs from yeah. the side. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. You just see the camera you kind have of to. twirl around him, man. God, cool as hell. It's to the point where you know a man is attractive. When you're sitting next to your wife of 11 years, and she sees him, and she goes, mm. "The sound, <laughs> just like a little bit of like a little audible, like you know, give a little, give a little it. love." I'm sure as you grunted, <laughs> well, I went like this. Uh, <laughs> <damn>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he looks great. He's great in this. He's. I think he steals the show. Every scene he's in, he's just great. His, his accent mirroring uh, Stellan Skarsgård's actual accent in real life. Fucking awesome. It's yeah. crazy great how choice. much this man can change his voice. Yep. yep. Uh, we're going to skip around here a little bit, but uh, uh, Leah Saito's in this, which yeah. is wild. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. She's great. The amount of like people that show up and I'm like, You're like are what? you kidding me? This is this is, is getting better. And she's so like a studio launch. One of our studio launches dude. like, how, who's going to come out next? Yeah, <laughs> yeah dude. Uh, I loved her performance in this too. And it's so deeply upsetting and fucked up. And it's like, we're talking about some bad people here. Like this Austin Butler guy, he's a bad dude. But she like d does the most unspeakable things to him. And it's just like, what the fuck is this movie? Like, what is the plot going on here? This is wild. And I just love how many layers there are to get into. This is another moment where there's a bunch of like stuff that Benny's not explaining to anyone, yep. but it's like the Benny Jesuits can control their hormones completely. So she's releasing like pheromones. That's why he's getting all drugged up and like, like really hoarded up. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so well done. And, ah, uh, uh, and, and we, we hear those lines. So a couple things were set up here. Yeah. That was great. Obviously yeah. she's giving him the test that Reverend Robert gave Paul in the beginning of the, uh, part one, which is weird. Cause he's not trained as, as the Benny Jesuit. Right. So she gave him that because he was trained because Paul is trained in the wearing ways. Which is yeah, the, I don't know. But, but, doesn't I, matter. but cool. look, Leah Saito says, yeah. stick your hand in the black box. I'm sticking my hand in the black You're box. Right? The yeah, boy yeah, likes yeah, yeah. pain. Uh, he likes pain. They're testing it basically to see if he's got what it takes to be the, the, the one or the leader going into it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I it, well, We're getting murky here. What they, what they were testing him was to see if they could control him. Right. That, that's when she comes back and she's like. He can be controlled with sex, with sex, with sex and yeah. humiliation. Yes. Yeah. And she's like, well, the Atreides are like, they can't be controlled. And that's one of the reasons why the Reverend Mother, mother was like, hey, Shadon, we got to take this family out. Well, yeah. I also love that she goes, Leah Saito's like, why did you, or actually it wasn't yeah. Leah Saito. I think it was, uh, no, it was Leah Saito oh, that was, was like, why did you why send? Why did you do it yourself? And yeah. he goes, well, he doesn't have the best relationship with his mother. Yeah. And then someone's like, what happened to his mother? He goes, he killed her. He murdered yeah. her. He murdered her. <laughs> This is badass. Uh, 
And then we don't see Leah's side of the rest of the time. Uh, we do know that there is another error now. Well, well around there Leah, Leah's outfit too. The, the costume design, uh, the costume movie, design is uh, costume. always All amazing. All the Bene Gesserit look incredible. But yeah. I love that she's mm -hmm. hooded, but then when you see her from behind, her arms are bare, and it's like, that's just tight. Man. It's, tight, man. it's yeah. awesome. Uh, where, where are we here? Jessica. I just love, I'll jump in Go again, just saying, I love that this seems like, I haven't read uh, Messiah or anything. I, I've actually bought Messiah after watching Tomb I'm glad Part I have two. One to read it too. Um, yeah. And I read the first 20 pages and I was like, holy fuck, this is a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm excited to dive into it. But I'm assuming this is all set up again. And again, stuff I love. Like you have these great actresses or great actors that you really only have in this movie for one scene. And I know a movie someone can just appear for one scene and that's great. They do a great job, but it just feels like with her getting pregnant and, and, you know, being another heir and being Fade Roth as kid, I feel like, I mean, we won't spoil anything. I know Kev knows what happens, but I just, it's such an interesting, you know, it's cool. It's so, sorry. Yeah. It's so, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. very Game of Thrones. We're setting something up. We don't yeah, know what. Exactly. Jessica completes her religious quest in the North before traveling South to unite the Fremen fundamentalists. So, uh, however, Paul fears his vision of a bloody holy war, uh, which will ignite uh, if in the pro if he proceeds uh, south as the Messiah. Remaining in the north, he reunites with Gurney. This was a weird moment, and Kevin brought up a very interesting point that was a change where Gurney's living a whole other life here, and it's what been like six months. How long no, has it been out I there? mean, yeah, somewhere because might, it was supposed to be longer, right? Because in yeah, the, in, in the book, in the, the baby book, was actually born. Yeah, in the book, this time oh, is two right. years. Yeah, there's a big change that happens at the end that I'll talk about later. Right. But yeah, so Aaliyah is born, um, and in this, it's she. By the end, she isn't born yet, so it's right. less than nine months. Which I, which, which makes more sense from like a storytelling standpoint. Yeah. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but in the book, people were like, she was like talking to people as a baby. It was really yes. creepy as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope we see that in Dune Messiah. Yeah. But it's really, it was well done in the sci-fi. Uh, she's like fully aware. Yeah. She's like, oh, I was like an adult, yeah. this baby body. Awesome. Yeah. It's fucking wild. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do, do, do. We see Gurney. Uh, now, I had a question about this because this goes by at such a fast clip that I, I didn't have Wait, a chance also, to understand what was going on here. Real quick. Gurney, knowing that he couldn't take down the Harkonnen, was like, well, we'll try to steal some of the spice. So he's a right. smuggler, right? Yeah. So this spice harvesting, this big machine, is something they stole, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that is... Was it not one of the machines that uh, it was similar to the? the but so is he trade? working for the Harkonnens as like a spy? No, no, he's selling it off world to other people. So who is this crew of people that he has with him? Are they bunch all just of, smugglers? Bunch of smugglers. Okay, yeah. and so they're just scared of the Harkonnens and the Fremen. Yeah, and pretty much everyone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. I loved his intro. Just Incredible. the shot of yeah. the the guitar, the guitar and him yeah. just like singing the song Again. and like. It, it, it was such a good setup of like these guys are working together, but they're not a team. Mm -hmm. Like they're just smuggler people. Yeah. Uh, but that was another thing of the, I, I think, I don't remember I talked about in the last one where it's like his past, he's from Gertie Prime, and uh, he was like, what? Giddy Prime. Giddy Prime. Yeah. Oh. I'm not going to pronounce any of these don't names. Don't worry about right? it, but yeah. his name Gertie? His name is his Gertie. Name is Gertie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, there so we go. Sorry, maybe Giddy he's Prime. from Gertie yeah. Prime. Yeah. He's yeah. from Giddy Prime, and he was uh, like, when they had banquets, he'd like come out as a little kid and sing and oh. stuff so that's why he's playing cool. the guitar that's also in the last movie there's a, a moment where paul's like sing me a song instead of fighting and it's like paul that's a really fucked up joke to me yeah yeah we get one of the coolest pieces of tech in this whole thing which are the landmines the the magnetic oh, oh mines that God. suck so to the cool, ship yeah. <laughs> and oh also we uh, haven't talked about this for the entire movie i I keep saying everything's the coolest thing ever, but legitimately <laughs> the coolest thing ever is any time they come out from the sand. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. when they have little like breathing things and they just like the come scuba? out. It's so tight. And like seeing these mm -hmm. mines, it does kind of the same thing. And mm -hmm. we've seen the people so many times that when this happened and it moved so quickly, I was like, this is just amazing. Like, what, like in the books, did they describe it that way? Like, or was, was this just them? Looks I remember. I, no, I, they do. I, he does go into detail about the the still suits, and I believe there was a lot of detail about specifically these like breathers that came yeah. out of out of the sand and all the all the steps they have to take to like conceal themselves and camouflage themselves and how they u utilize the sand as basically their ally. A lot of that stuff I, I do remember being in the book. I, again, it's been fifteen years since I probably read it, so or maybe longer. Um, all that stuff is just so rad, though. The fact that there's a moment here where I think it's either Paul or someone else is sniping 
and they've got like Overwatch, and it's all you can see is just like a little bit of something like poking out of this. They're just completely concealed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can basically mm -hmm. look through the sand. Super cool. Of course, they don't call, kill Gurney. Why? Because he'd recognize his steps anywhere, old man. Come on. Great, great back. Set up. Payoff. you love to see it. I nearly Boom. teared up in that moment. That was such a good line. <laughs> Gurney is like, yo, this is awesome. He's like, but you're never going to get these people. We need to have a plan B. You know what plan B is? I may have or may not have hidden all the Atreides' atomics. The family nukes. The family nukes, yeah. Tim. <laughs> And so basically from there, I think he's like, hey, we got to go take care of these nukes. Like, where'd you hide him? He's like, right there. And Silgar's like, that's a stupid place to hide him. And he goes, well, did you find him? Well, I wasn't looking. He's so like, I wasn't looking. Great. Exactly. Getting the yeah. squad together. Them, their dynamics are great. The reveal of the atomics. Could it be cooler? No, it simply can't. I love how much this ratchets up the, the entire, like, sense of like what is going on here and i was like how are they gonna pull this off like this sounds a little too powerful and the way that they ended up handling i was like oh that was masterful that was like mm -hmm. not i thought it was gonna be like the i the, don't literally mean this but oh here we go blue beam in the sky type of yeah like ravaging up the missiles. stakes no man it was just icbm ass yeah. missiles man yeah yeah uh he's like well i don't know if i want to use these or whatever this is gonna ignite everything but eventually yeah, they do uh this is where if i if, uh if I'd, Comes in and bombs the siege, uh, killing pretty much everyone. The only person that can't get away is Shashakli, uh, who is a uh, Chinese friend. She unfortunately, they're like, she's not gonna, she's not gonna talk. And and Fade goes, well, uh, this I, I forget how he phrased it, but it was the most haunting thing you could possibly say. Where he's like, I have all the information I need. Now it's time for entertainment or yep. something oh, to yeah, that that's degree. What he said. That's and then what he, he lights said. her on fire and with a flamethrower. Oh, dude. <laughs> It's a great cut too. Another good example. Like, we don't need to yeah. see this, don't but like it. our minds exactly. are even worse. From here, Paul gets Wait, a message. Real quick, Nick, you've read the book, right? To, I mean, uh, I'm not, not going to be yeah. a good. I'm not a good witness of this. It's been 20 years, probably. Because like in the book, Shawnee has a kid with with uh, Paul, and like I can't remember if he dies here because he he dies. This this first oh. son dies. And like I think it was when they they do the first attack, but it doesn't matter. They've cut that out of the the like she's not having a kid clearly. Yeah. I thought it was his quiet. brother or something like that. Like I I thought it wasn't Shawnee and him unless that was later. But I could have I thought I read somewhere that Paul had a brother that they cut out of the movie that dies. Maybe I'm wrong. I, no, I, no, I don't think no? so. Because never had a brother in the, yeah, the okay. beginning. Yeah, like Paul. Lady Jessica broke a lot of rules to make yeah. that. I don't know right. if she would do it again. Um, but like oh, yeah, no, I think that's right. Paul's brother Steve. Right? <laughs> Just kill Steve? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Moving right along with the plot. Uh, Paul, Jessica tells Paul, look, you got you to gotta, you gotta drink this water of life if you want to go to your full potential. Uh, she tells one of the ladies there uh, where the water of life comes from. She learns that, which is a fucked up scene where... This is also around when we start getting, like, he sees the dream of uh, Chani dying from the atomic blast. And it's like, that kind of implies that, like, now that they have those nukes, everything is leading to her dying and like them fucking up the world, right? Yeah. Well, either way, it's yeah. going to be him losing her to yeah. some degree. Uh, we get the water of life moment where they suck it out of the dead baby sandworm out of its little Pretty stomach. Cool. Pretty cool. And then Lady Jessica says, "Look, at some point, a guy's, a man's going to come asking for this again, furthering the prophecy and all the propaganda." Yeah. Man, you know, a uh, guy's going to come. He's about uh, six feet, blue eyes, yeah. maybe. Blonde Is hair. it your son? Oh. Well, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> could be whatever. Sure. Could be whatever. Uh, he's going to come. and He's going to do this. Of course, Paul shows up the next fucking day. <laughs> it's like we're going. I love that everyone rides the sandworms. Yeah, I was going to say that scene is so cool. Yeah. Wow. They're like, all right, we all like everyone that survived the the siege being bombed. We need to get out now. And they've got the these cool little pods and they're all hanging it, out man. family road trip yeah dude uh, he takes the, fa the the water of life falls into a coma and is only reawakened by chani when she cries and gives uh, desert tears you know desert what i mean spring, Tim? whatever it is was that what did it <laughs> i mean that's you're bringing up interesting stuff here kev mm -hmm. but i i i love i was such a sucker for the little reveals and bits of this of like the the what was it the her desert her what's name? her name desert yeah. desert spring desert, desert, desert spring. spring and he's the tears yeah. of desert spring and she's like well that's her fucking name she's desert <laughs> spring the this desert is spring. awesome man was this where we get the anya taylor joy yes. reveal this is where he yeah. finally sees her sort of fully realized as an adult when he right. in the coma and they talk. the shot of the the dunes the sand dunes going down and then you see the waves start coming in and then we go down in and like we're right next to the waves and we're following like the hooded character from behind the reveal of anya taylor joy 
Joy with those blue ass eyes. It's like, this is so cool. And I just would have never seen this coming. And it it was weird how emotional it made me to see an ocean on this planet. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know how it's they perfect. earned that, but they did. We uh, he he awakens. He learns. Obviously, he talks to his sister. From here on out, we'll hear her voice as uh, as the baby. Uh, he also learns a very important fact, which is that uh, he is in fact a descendant of the Baron, who is his grandfather, because Jessica, his mother, Rebecca Ferguson, is uh, an illegitimate child of Vladimir Baron or Vladimir Harkonnen. Excuse me. I uh, so to talk about what you guys were saying with uh, Timothy Chalamet, not like getting there a lot of moments like with the acting a lot of the moments with jessica like always felt a little forced to me where, where he's like starts getting mad and worked up and it's just like that that's where i felt like a little bit of weakness in his performance fair yeah fair. i can see that southern fremen leaders hope for paul to challenge stilgar for leadership this is the sequence we get where paul rushes in and chani's like see he's like sit down you know all that stuff gurney realizes what's going Love on him here grabbing her. he's like you gotta just <laughs> this is gonna happen no matter what there's no fighting at this point he's already won uh, of course he has a great line here where he was like why would you why would i smash my best blade before battle I'm not gonna. So I'm not good. gonna kill him. What I am gonna do is show you all who I really am. And he starts reading people's like dreams and thoughts and sitting them down. And everyone's like, "Holy shit!" And one by one, he converts everyone. Of course, except for Chani, he was like, "This is all bullshit. Like magic. Something's happening here." And he's like, "I'm going to lead you all to to the paradise. I I am the the Mahdi and the Messiah, the Lizard, all guy, all these things." And they're like, "Fuck it, let's rock. Let's do this thing." Um, I I I get it, and it's a plot, and it's a movie, and it's characters, blah blah blah. I. I'm a little not sold on Shawnee not like being so against him because yeah. it's like throughout the movie as they fall in love and they have all these scenes, he's kind of telling her, hey, and like proving, I see the future a bit. Things are bad. I'm going to have to do things that I don't want to do. It's the only way. And she's like, I get it. I get it. I get it. And then she just doesn't get it. Yeah. And it's and a little weird. Cut to like, you're an outsider. And yeah. it's like, well, that's you, but like earlier, you were like, "Oh no, you're one of us now." Yeah, you know, th this is a deviation from the book. Where, like, in the book, she's more okay with it, like mm. not resisting that that hmm. the idea of him becoming something greater. In fact, later she'll push him in the books, but it does seem like it's deviating. Also, they had a kid, so that's deviated as well. Yeah, you can you can see this sort of as a narrative device because we don't really have Paul really come up against too much ideological opposition to him so i think it's a smart choice on the oh. writer's part to buff that part of her character up it also mm -hmm. makes her a three-dimensional character yeah. as opposed to just someone who is another person that's just in the you know yep. doing up scenery in the background and it gives zendaya something more to do so i agree with this decision to kind of have that and again it goes to back up the theme of being like she knows a lot of this shit is full of shit mm. um and she doesn't want to lose control of her planet she doesn't want her people to fall falling in with yet another colonizer just because he talks yeah. the talk and walks the walk yeah. totally i think that's a great i think that's a very very riveting and fascinating thing to explore from here man i'll tell you what this is where this is where the emperor comes in, and he's like, <laughs> "The Mahdim is fine. We gotta go." Really oh, that's, so. that's where they send the letter to the emperor, right? right? So this is where he sends yeah, the letter, yeah. and he reads. He's like, oh, it, "This he just I, drops I'm, it." Yeah, I'm Paul, and I'm telling everyone what's up, and I'm witness to this. And once the houses realize what's going on here, uh, the, you're screwed. They're gonna they're gonna revolt against you, and they're gonna overthrow you and kill you. We've also set up that uh, he was really pushed to do this by the Reverend Mother, who was. Pulling the strings behind, he's like, I don't know where the hell I'm You want me to kill that person? I'll kill that person. Whatever. Just use the voice on me again. It's great. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Walk in it turns into a great performance here. Sort of a broken older man who's like, I have lost control. And I, I see where this is going to, but the only thing I could do is go there myself. They bring their badass chrome ball of a ship to, so cool. to, into orbit. They land, uh, pouring out all well, the. Well, they don't land, right? It just floats. It's just floating. Yeah. Like, and it's also. The visual the of this heat coming off yeah, of it, the heat, the oh. fires, all that stuff is so sick. But like it just being this like big mirror and it mm -hmm. floating over the sand dunes, and you see the reflection of it on the sand, and you see the like just the the shadow of the circle kind of deform and like scatter uh, across the different dunes. I'm like, god damn! Like mm. the VFX artist went so yeah. hard on that bit, and it, so it paid good. off, man. Like it sells it so much. They were like, Stan, you got to go home, and he's like, no. <laughs> I'm riding this one out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also think we missed the part. Did we talk about him putting the ring back on, and that's how the emperor knows that he's oh, alive we didn't. again? Because he yeah. uses his signet, right, like yeah. on the the wax on the. On the I just got thing, chills to prove to, 
Yeah, just to prove that he's alive. Because at that point, the emperor doesn't really know that Paul is still alive, right? So then when he sees the ring being uh, on the scroll, I just thought that's a really cool moment where Paul, again, finally buys into him being this messiah, but then also wants to kind of get revenge for his father and then for House Atreides and stuff like that and trying to balance both those things, I think is interesting. And then that's such a cool moment with the ring and putting the wax on again. We see all, of course, the Sardukar troops have poured out now. They're all in rank and file. All of them. All of them protecting the ship. Maybe not the best of ideas here. Well, I mean, you have to realize, too, like, they show us the map of what's going on a couple of times, and it's like they have found this, like, crescent mountain that they've put themselves in. So, like, they're surrounded by mountains, so they can't get attacked by the worms. They can't get attacked very easily, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a show of force to the Harkonnens to be like, hey, y'all fucking this up. Now I have to deal with this kid. Right, fair. It's just one of those where like a tactical error, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna be at this planet, I guess you have to have a show of force. And yes, it it shows the 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 chutzpah that you have mm-hmm. to land on on Arrakis and outside of a shield wall. Maybe land inside the shield wall next mm-hmm. time. That's why shield walls exist. Mm-hmm. Because what do they do first? Launch some nukes at him. Wait, no, no. Before that, isn't yeah? This is before. Before he is sitting on the throne. And has the Harkonnens come. Yes. And they fucking cut him down. Yeah. And he drops to the ground and he's just wiggling there. He's like, eh. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like a big baby in like one of those onesies. And the yep. kid's like, my feet don't work because he won't let him out. Yeah. <laughs> he won't let him out of the sack. Let him out. But like, they were going to kill him, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. You have to imagine. And then, and also again, another great performance for Austin Butler here was kind of like, scared but also delighted in the fact that excited yeah yeah. because like where does it go that his uncle's gonna die and i know this is like the most obvious thing to say ever but the amount of star wars in this is so crazy and then i'm just like how like the sand crawlers even and like just the level of like there's there's vader but then there's the emperor and seeing him in this having the breathing apparatus like where it's like that's the circle thing uh yeah around him it just goes like I think that's all going through because he got poisoned. Like now he needs more things to like keep him alive. And it's stuff. amazing, yep. man. And yeah. it's just like I Dune is potentially the most influential thing ever created. And I'm so mm-hmm. happy I'm watching this to see how it kind of affected so much going forward. Um, agreed. From here, the atomics get launched. <laughs> and, and how do they get used? Man, they, they blow up a fucking mountain. Yeah, they blow up a mountain yeah. so that. The Fremen can ride in on their uh, metaphorical stallions, and but these, in fact, are big sandworms, and they just chew through everything and destroy everything. And for, and then the counter, they, they also did they did the cool thing where it's like, here's a little map of what's going on. Yeah. Hey, we're going to come from the north. You're going to come from the east. We're going to come from the west. Whatever. We get more of them popping out of the sand. Shit goes down. Chani fucks a ton of people up. She has she gets a cool action sequence here. If, if I may, just go sure. step back one moment. It's incredible that a movie can have so many scenes that are the greatest scene I've ever seen. But like these worms coming out of what used to be a mountain that's collapsing and just like, oh, like four or five worms shooting out. And it's just like, this is action in its fucking best. And it's like, everything about this is incredible. Go watch this movie, please, God. From here, we get them, the emperor kind of held up in uh, in their stronghold, in the, in the throne room. They're they're now being surrounded. We're hearing the horror and the shock of them losing outside of the door. And then who should walk through out of the mist, out of the shadows, is Paul. And he just walks in. And I love the, the, the confidence with which he strides because he walks right up to who are the hardest killers in the world, the Sardaukar, with their swords, just walks right up and kind of looks at the blade because he knows he's in no danger because he's got about 3,000 Fremen behind him who are coming into this room that are going to cut them down. Again, the silence here. Like, these badass armed guys walking into this, and you don't hear anything. You don't hear, like, conflict. You just see Timothy Chalamet walk out, like Luke goddamn Skywalker in Return of the Jedi (laughs) in all black, and his cape just flowing is nasty it's nasty he says uh, keep the the emperor all the vantage as prisoners kill the sardaukar kill him so cool tough from there we go over to uh yeah, a nice little view of arrakis and the war that's going on downstairs and he's like listen here's what's going to happen there's there's two realities that we have here let me lay it out for you mr walken uh number one you try to you know you, you abdicate the throne to me uh if you do that cool you're cool with it maybe cool uh, I'll marry your daughter. And she's like, if you don't kill my dad, I'll go willingly. She sees sort of like, 
think she understands too that she's like, this is what's gonna happen. Well, to r- real quick, the first thing he does isn't does he walk into the room and fucking just? <laughs> oh well, he does kill. Uh, I'm sorry, I do yeah. miss that part. Yeah. He, he he says hello, grandfather, and then stabs him in the neck, and then he goes, "You're gonna die like an animal." And then we cut over just randomly. He's just out in the middle of the desert, answer eating his face. Oh, brutal. Yeah, that was rough. Now. One deviation from the book that, like, man, it's a bummer because I really liked the way they did it in the book. So Aaliyah is born. She's a one-year-old running around with the Ben, Ben, what is it called? Ben Kajab? The, the little needle? The little needle. The poison needle. So she actually runs up and stabs him. Little, little, little one-year-old. Yeah. Little yeah. Tyler runs wow. up and says, like, hey, Grandpa. And, just, and, and then she scampers off and goes up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, this scene where where he's like, I'm gonna take her as my wife and whatever, it's all gonna be good. And we just see uh, Shawnee like so upset. Like this was, I think, the first time we got like uh, an actual like vocalization out of the audience. Of people. Like there was like multiple groups of people like, no, <laughs> like, they were so upset about it. And I was like, that's hella funny. And, and, uh, question though about about Shawnee here, like because we see her kick ass outside, like during the the war scene. I was gonna bring that part amazing. up, Tim, because you brought it up last week. I think when we isn't that the same sequence Paul sees? Yes, of himself, but him. right when he's yeah. Oh, but come then on, here it's Shawnee. Yeah, which is cool because like, what is that? Like, are you um, talking about the white where he's wearing? the golden armor everyone else is wearing yeah. the white armor i don't think that's sort the same of. sequence right? it seems it's shot like the exact it same way ex- yeah like yeah. even the like, way her face is revealed in the middle of the war and then like you get yeah. the reveal of the turnaround the face it's shot framed exactly the yeah. same it's the only time that they're all fighting in the armor so because yeah. yeah. chinese got like armor around her in this one and i think he had some but it, too, no, so it, I don't, it wasn't but it was armor like, they were wearing their their sarda car with like scarves all over right they're they're um the no, there suits. was no, no, because you see her and she has like a flak jacket style like armor on. They all do. Yeah. They're, they're like, all beefed up. They're all. They don't have up. the cool gold armor though. The, yeah, not, not gold. One thing. The question is I have is I why did she wrap the blue <laughs> thing, like the blue scarf around her? I'll tell was you that why. just so that we know it's her? Yeah. yeah. But even that, like, that was weird because it was like she wore it earlier you know in the movie. <laughs> she wore it early in the movie, but I think it was just the setup visually for the costume. Yeah. Kind of like we're not, we're gonna lose everyone in this, and we can, we need a visual point of yeah. reference. Her, for her. friend should have worn the scarf earlier, and then she would have put it on as like a remembrance of her. <laughs> you know, that would have made sense. Could've worked. It was just weird Could've because worked. we we didn't follow enough. Oh, we didn't follow any other armored fighter. So it's like, of course, the one we're following is her. Yeah, like we didn't need that, but what? we also see her face. So. You know, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. do know who it is because we can see everybody. Exactly. That's true. That's a weird one. I want to give a yeah. shout out to the camera or the, to the actual physical blocking in the sequence where he's making the 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 deal with the emperor because I, I do love it's you know they're just like it's her standing on one side re- representing Paul's past and then uh, uh, the princess standing on the other and they're kind of mirrored. Yep. And they're the only people who don't kneel when the emperor does. And by the way, you got to respect Christopher Walken's like he's like. Didn't kiss the ring really, but he's like, I'll give it to him. Dude, but, <laughs> but how I'm not badass, making contact with How badass body. when he like does it and he just sticks his hand out and stomps. Bah. Yeah. And Again, like, cool. such good use of sound. That stomp Ugh. was so intense. Of course, the at this point, uh do we do we as a as a counter as a counter offensive, the Emperor called in earlier, he called in all the houses and said the future of the Empire is at stake. Y'all gotta come here. Because some shit's going down. Yeah. They all show up in the atmosphere, and Paul tells them, I'm the new emperor. To which they respond, Nope, we do not accept it. <laughs> and Paul's like, Yep, I knew you were going to say that. I knew it because yep. I know how I this can is going to go. The future now. And now, here starts the holy war. Mm-hmm. Here starts this massive what, war that's going to kill millions of people. What does he say? Like, uh, on to paradise or something? Take them to paradise. Take them to paradise. Yeah, take them to he paradise. He goes, What do you want to do? He goes, Take them to paradise. Yeah. Which means fucking light the match. Guns and Roses going. starts, the credits hit. Incredible. Take me down <laughs> I, I mentioned this before. I do want to give a shout out to the costume in this. I think that I think Florence Pugh's sort of like knights of the old, like of yore, her sort of chain, chain mill, but like dagger mm-hmm. costume might be the coolest thing in this whole movie. The coolest thing in this movie, costume wise for me, well, besides just uh, Paul's like cape, I loved it, is Austin Butler's when he's in full battle armor like we get like the little like the Very black cool. pieces yeah. everywhere Holy and his and crap, black man. teeth so tight That's and cool the fit. fight that they had that we're getting to uh oh right so but um, we did yeah, miss that, that yeah, we skipped yeah, that yeah. huge point which is that yeah. <laughs> the emperor the emperor gets to choose his challenger of course it's going to be fade and they have a badass fight and paul you assume pulls the dagger out of himself to stab him with and then fade says you fought well uh, Paul Atreides or whatever it is, and mirroring what he said to the old guy that he killed, except he's the one who's dead in this one, and uh, everyone is very happy about that. No music, psychopath for this fight. Don't need awesome. It. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Just like yeah. let's let let them fight. I, I love that. There's also the the moment earlier in the movie where like you're seeing random flashes, and one is the flash of the the blade in his 
uh, body. I was going to bring that up. Thank you, Kev. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I was going to ask you, does he talk about that in part one as well? Or was that about um, just Jason Momoa or something? Because I, I wasn't sure if he saw himself being stabbed in the first movie. I'm trying to go back. No, I know it wasn't in, in that the, long ago. But... In the first movie, he sees himself getting stabbed by Chani it, like, right. as an alternate future thing. Mm, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he kills him. The emperor bends a knee. They go to war. And that is Dune part two. Unless I missed the post-credit sequence because I really had to pee at this point. Yeah, I didn't stay. No. I yeah, didn't. I had too, I had no. too much no. going on. I had to go outside and talk to yeah. Garrett. You know, it's, it's really Den- funny. Denny be- doesn't do post-credits. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny because uh, when it ended, like, I was excited to talk to you guys about, like, what Messiah is and Children of Dune and all that just to see if it was a sequel because I kind of assumed just some things I remember you saying at some point that it was more like, meanwhile, like, or backstory of Jason Momoa or whatever because I thought, like, this movie ends in such a brilliant way where we almost i want a sequel more than anything but we don't need one because just seeing the future shit it's like cool they win like they they get it all and the holy war happens and i just i feel like it's a pretty cool end here where it's like you we could see the details but we almost don't need them because it's just like we understand how this goes at least a version of it that's the whole point of dune very cool that's the whole point of the, the book series on like what it means to build up this messiah yeah and what going forward what you have to do to keep everything going once the propaganda to follow works. the golden path yeah yeah oh man that's yeah. awesome crazy and there it is dune part two everybody <gasps> uh, oh also the reveal that the planet's named dune oh such a sucker for that's that name that for was it. great yeah. that was cool <laughs> as hell man oh man Woo. any any final words matt on dune two it's awesome, man. Like I, I really do hope that we get um, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. I know that they've already shot that HBO series about the Bene Gesserit that takes place, I think, centuries earlier. Um, so I know we're getting that uh, later this year. Um, so I'm pretty stoked for that. But yeah, like we all mentioned earlier, just please, if you listen to this and, and are interested at all and didn't go see the movie, please go support it because I, I really, really do want more. And that's why I bought Dune Messiah. Cause I, I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to wait three years to figure mm-hmm. out what happens. So, uh, I know there's many series and different things like that, but, um, uh, I, heard of these things called books um you can <laughs> get spoilers for movies much earlier than the movies come out so i'm gonna try to try one of those out i, I don't think there is a dune, uh the messiah like i believe that children of dune has a miniseries and that yeah I sums think it up had, messiah like, ele- mm, yeah exactly yeah. it had like elements yeah. of no messiah it, but it kind of combined them yeah Watch a bunch of YouTube. Yeah. That's the way that's cool, it's it's Kev, please send me those videos because legit. Exactly. I, 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 yeah. I want to know. Tim, like, man. you don't know what you're like. I, there are hour long videos. Yeah. That, uh, Quinn Ideas is like, he makes phenomenal like YouTube videos. videos. About Tim, you, right. could, you yeah. could just read the book. No. No, who's got time? <laughs> read for that? the book. Who's got time? Listen for that? to the audio, like the, an abridged nerd audio nerd adaptation. I, yeah. I, I can't. Abridged. Do you want to. Sh- oh. I fall asleep. Like, and I, I wish I could. I just, like, I try reading and I just fucking fall asleep. I'm a pretty it's, bad reader, too, Tim. Like, yeah. I, I, I suck at it. Like, unless it's a graphic novel or something like that with pictures, yeah. I'm like, I'm three words in and I'm like, have to reread paragraphs over and over again. I, I, I have the problem I'm with I'm going to try. Like these comics, same thing. I love comics. I love reading them, but I, I, they put me to sleep. Like it's really. I'm a baby, baby. So it is what it is. You are what you want. Uh, let us know in the comments below how many times you're planning to see Dune in theaters. Dune two in theaters. They're doing a lot of Dune one and two double features, which is wild. But go for that. Support that because we need to support Mouthy here. Okay, Mouthy needs. Mouthy needs to eat Mouthy. everyone <laughs> for just seventeen dollars. You could buy a ticket to a movie theater near you. And then for another twenty four dollars, you can get a mouthy of your own. <laughs> Please, for the go low, see low Dune. price of fifty US dollars. In fact, dollars. if you if you see Dune more than once this weekend, or more than once in its run, come back to this video. Let us know in the comments below because we need to support this. Let mouthy eat. Mouthy, are you hungry? What's that? You want to eat? You want to eat again? Now, where can people find you? Uh, you can find all my work around the internet, but mostly at uh, Untitled Movie Podcast, which you can subscribe to on all podcast services or on YouTube. And you can follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. Hell yes. Thank you for joining <laughs> us, everybody. Till next time. Love you all. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>